right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome Jeff Goldberg for our discussion today on Donald Trump, the free press, and the future of American democracy. I, I wasn't really concerned about Jeff's ability to draw a crowd, even on a day that's not perfect weather, but as you could see, there is huge demand to hear, to hear from you. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of time with introductions, and I also, at risk, of uh, sounding too much like a fanboy. Well, I'm going to do it anyway and just tell you, I think The Atlantic has been such an extraordinary platform for so many... For so many different views from across the spectrum at this you know, quite contentious moment, obviously, in politics, and it's been happening under your watch as editor-in-chief, and you were a great contributor to that content just before as a writer. So I'll, I'll thank you as a reader and uh, just a tremendous admirer of what you're doing. Uh, we are going to do this as a conversation for, uh, for a little while, for 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up to all of your questions. So let's just plunge right into yeah, it, if you don't mind. Uh, so here I'll just speak personally for a moment and say, you know, of course I'm quite taken just visually by all these apparent uh, breakdowns of norms between uh, a candidate and then a president and the, the press. So the obvious stuff, the calling out of individual journalists, um, Megyn Kelly, you know, a variety of people, often women, the vilification, the sometimes implicit um, summoning up of, of violence or hatred and, um, well, the mendacity in public fora. Uh, but how do you really feel? Yeah, so it's kind of wild. <laughs> it's kind of wild. But my question to you, Jeff, is, all right, so we all know this going, but has anything really changed? Is there anything fundamentally different about how you do journalism today from, I don't know, two years ago? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, we have to recognize, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I love Brown University. Um, my wife tells me that I have to say that. She's very, very deeply involved in Brown University, but I love it anyway. Um, and I'm all glad to see all of you here, and thank you for having me, and thanks to Watson for having me. Um, the, uh, you have to recognize a couple of things. One is that, to some degree, we're both, we, the, the administration and the press, are part of the same reality TV show right now, in the sense that both parties seemingly at loggerheads are benefiting from the the drama of the relationship. Uh, I mean, Trump is obviously, I mean, there have been studies that show, I don't know how these numbers are generated, $2 billion in free advertising, uh, the equivalent of free advertising right. during the campaign, because he was putting on a show that was broadcast and published and, and talked about. Um, and, and we benefit, especially since the election, uh, in, in terms of subscriptions and reader engagement. Uh, I mean, we have benefited as much as anybody else uh, from this. And so uh, Donald Trump has brought about uh, a kind of a salad day kind of situation for us. Uh, and, and, and we shouldn't act like it's all woe is me. Uh, the republic is coming to an end. Uh, journalists are uh, relevant and engaged and excited by what's going on, and, 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 that, and that is something. The reality TV show comes to an end when somebody gets killed. And I, and I think, um, and, you know, and, and, and I think that we are in a, in a liminal moment right now in which it is completely plausible to think that a deranged follower of Donald Trump, somebody sympathetic to Donald Trump, who doesn't understand his intense cynicism, uh, really does believe the, the, his Stalinist formulation that the press is the enemy of the people. And that is a Stalin. That is actually right. drawn from Stalin. Um, I mean, you might as well go right to the root, sure. right, right to the source. Um, and, and, so, and so somebody is going to do something, I'm afraid. I hope, God forbid, that doesn't happen. Uh, somebody's going to do something that physically harms a journalist or a group of journalists. And then I do believe that that's on... Donald Trump's, that's on, that's on his conscience, you know, that, 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 that he, is, he is, by violating these norms, I mean, no president likes the press, right? right? The press is annoying. But, but part of the bargain that, that the people and the press and the president have collectively made over and across the modern 
era is that the press does this thing, it's annoying to the president. The president doesn't answer questions, that's annoying to the press. The people benefit in some way from it. Donald Trump has violated that, 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 that fundamental norm. And so we're in, this, we're, in a, we're in a moment where nothing catastrophic has happened, but I think that we're setting up, uh, we're, we're set up for something to plausibly happen. I don't know whether you want to talk about this, but you wrote personally about being the, I don't know, the recipient of lots of anti-Semitic tweets. And um, I mean, you had an incredible Which account. Which is amazing, because I'm Muslim. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that actually, that gets to the point. The article I found to be horrifying. At the same time, I, I, I was laughing, because there was a kind of acid humor that you approached it with. And it felt as yeah. if you were saying, OK, it's, you know, Show me some creativity. I've seen so, all these attacks before. Yeah, no, 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 no. The great, the great, the saving grace of most American Nazis is that they're terrible spellers. <laughs> and no, 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 no. I, I really believe this. When they actually become articulate and learn proper grammar and spelling, that's when you worry because that show that they have some brain power behind this. Um, no, I think partially because I'm cynical, partially because I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and Pakistan and Afghanistan in the '90s and 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 Syria and, and Iraq. I mean, I, I know what. Real anti, you know, real life-threatening anti-Semitism is. Um, I was fortunate enough in my life to know and be friends with Danny Pearl, and so you, you, you know, for everybody knows who Danny Pearl is. I don't assume that on a university campus anymore. The Wall Street Journal uh, reporter who was uh, beheaded by Al Qaeda in 2002, late 2002. Um, uh, so, so partially, it's these, you know, it's these. Dockers wearing Nazis with their tiki torches really don't freak me out. Um, maybe they should. Uh, but I was actually, by the way, I was, I was proud of that. I was the number three most hated Jew on Twitter, um, which is the bronze medal of being hated on Twitter for being Jewish. And, you know, and I was sort of jealous of the silver and, and, and gold. Um, I, I mean, to, I, I'm very competitive, you and, know, and I'm the, extremely competitive. I want to be number one. Were. I want to be, I want to be, um, I don't even remember their names. <laughs> um, I wanted to be number one. Um, a very, very famous TV uh, anchor uh, uh, told me that, uh, called me and told me that he was on the list, and I pointed out that he was number seven, which doesn't even get you <laughs> near the medal stand. Um, no, I think we do, I, 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 it, it is unpleasant when they attack your family, um, or, are, are know who your family is. I mean, the web is the web, and you can figure things out. Um, there, there's a point at which the you know the death threats have to be reported to the FBI, and then they're investigated. We went through a long period when Twitter was not responding. Twitter, in particular, right. Facebook, some degree, but Twitter was not really um, seized by that particular issue, and it was getting a little bit in just the sheer velocity of the hate. I should have known then that Donald Trump was going to win because that energy was the energy and that hatred was, 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 had, had this intense velocity to it. It's right. interesting. Maybe I, I could pick up on your point about, well, there's sort of a symbiotic relationship between an extravagantly different president and, and then the media benefiting maybe commercially or just through readership. In the current issue of The Atlantic, Jack Goldsmith, I thought, had a great piece. I, I, I recommend the current issue, all issues of The Atlantic. But Goldsmith, if I've got it right, he starts out by saying uh, that the Trump administration, or Donald Trump, is like a Frankenstein-like creation of all the worst attributes of previous presidents. OK, so very negative. But then he, he turns the argument and says, but you know, when you have somebody who's breaking norms, what often happens is other institutions or people start giving up their own norms. And he kind of yeah. takes a shot at the press. He says yeah. the, I don't know whether it's elite media or mainstream media, but I assume he's pointing to New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, is uh, CNN and the whole CNN, range. Right, yeah, is that yeah. they are responding by shifting into advocacy, or you know, they're the resist movement, or they are, um, um, uh, you know, journalists will tweet their opinions, and that they are compromising their own objectivity and yeah. credibility in front of the American public. And I, I, I don't know what to make of that. I was taken by that argument. And yeah. I, I, I mean, so just, just for, for a bit of context, Jack Goldsmith, uh, 
He's a Republican. Uh, actually, he's an independent now, but I mean, he served in the Justice Department under George W. Bush. He's a conservative. That's right. Um, and he's in the he's in that camp of. Uh, I mean, the most interesting people in America are the homeless conservatives, the ones who uh, remain true to their conservative ideals but reject Trump as a false conservative and as a, as a, right. as a false. And you've problem. given many of them voice. And he's uh, yeah. I mean, I'd like to. Yeah, we're a refugee camp for <laughs> for homeless conservatives, um, which is great. I mean, and they really are interesting. People who don't have, people who, who, who are disconnected now from their, their not only their, their ideological comrades, but their friends. In many cases, right. you know, in, in this group of people, they've lost friendships over this. It's, it's destroyed a lot it, it, within the Republican framework. Um, so he comes at it from a conservative uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, his piece is very nuanced, I think, very nuanced, especially compared to some of the other things you read. Um, take one further step back. Uh, it's, it was very important to me right after the election that we not join the quote resistance. And I said this, I told this to our staff. I said, you know, there are a lot of publications went down a certain path. I'm not criticizing them, yeah. but, but I said, you know, we, we don't have to join the resistance. Just, just do your jobs. Double down on the thing that you do, which is try to drive a fact based discourse about whatever issues happen to be most pertinent in, in society at the moment. Uh, but, but we're, we're, the goal of our journalism is not to bring down a president. The goal of journalism is to tell the truth. If the truth happens to work against a presidency, well, so be it. Um, but what, what, what Jack is saying, and I, I see his point. I mean, one of the things I've learned as um, editor, as editor of, a, of a big tent magazine um, is that I'm going to wind up disagreeing with a lot of the stuff that I publish. The only thing that matters to me is not whether, it doesn't matter whether I disagree with it. It matters whether it's the best argument that could be made right. from that perspective. Um, and so I don't fully buy his assessment that the media uh, in general uh, has, has, is violating its own norms by using language such as the president lied. You know, this mm -hmm. is the classic example. I actually, I actually come at this in, in another way, which is to think that in August, September, October of last year, um, we were slower than maybe we should have been to point out the truly novel aspects of Trump's approach toward empirical truth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and, and we weren't, I mean, these are my colleagues across the quote unquote mainstream media. We're not equipped, we weren't equipped for a person to uh, do the things that, that he did and then become more popular. Yeah. That, that, that was a reversal of the pattern. You don't um, mock John McCain for falling prisoner to the Vietnam, to North Vietnamese and then become more popular. That's not in the, in the right. previous American political formula. So we were, we were slower than we should have been to, to calling it out for what it is. Uh, and, and so I, I think on that point, I probably disagree with him to some degree. I, I recognize the valid, I recognize that he that he's made a careful argument there, um, but but none of us institutions are not fully really equipped yet to grapple with um, again the novelty of the approach that he's taking, the president's yeah. taking. Um, I was struck just in the last couple of days. I was reading little pieces of Hillary Clinton's new book of, of uh, what happened and also listening to some of her interviews and she makes a critique of the press that's from you know from left of center that's I think similar to Jack Goldsmith she basically says or suggests the New York Times had it out for her from early on and there's misogyny and, and personal issues but that they that the New York Times define their mission as they are going to expose the Clinton machine. And then she suggests, whether you, know, you accept the argument or not, that there are editorial decisions you know, to cover the email scandal um, rather than uh, Russian meddling. And that it's, it's not just the facts, it's editorial choice. And for whatever reason, the media, or at least this media outlet, is on a mission. And I, right. You know, no, it, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not unsympathetic to her, her viewpoint on this particular subject. Again, this, this has to do, I, I, don't, I don't ascribe avariciousness, uh, capriciousness to the New York Times in the way that she, she might be doing. Yeah. Um, uh, there, the old impulses kicked in um, in covering these two general election candidates. Um, 
the, the, the impulse and the, the healthy impulse is this person is a flawed person and we're going to expose their flaws before they get to become president. This person is a flawed person and we're going to expose their flaws before they get to become president, right? right? But that, that what you risk there, and, and this is where I, again, am sympathetic, is, is um, you know, Benghazi, for instance, um, was, uh, it was a tragedy, an American tragedy. She did not kill the people in Benghazi. She was not making the decisions about how to staff embassies in Libya, sure. and yet this was conflated in a way uh, uh, across some of the media. In particular, the complaint with the New York Times has to do with the email coverage. Yeah. Um, and I think in the fullness of time, um, this is my own personal viewpoint, we understand now that um, her closet server um, is it not the moral or uh, ethical equivalent of the Access Hollywood tape, right. for instance. Uh, and, and so I can understand why, why people associated with the Clinton campaign, why she herself would feel a, as if, in the interest of balance, right. um, she was, uh, uh, negative characteristics were ascribed to her. Remember also, there's another thing here, which is that the press, we, we also like novelty. This is a little bit of a critique of the press, but it's actually just a critique of human nature. Yeah. Um, 20 years of the Clintons, people were bored. Um, 20 years of the Clintons, people, reporters who had been through the Monica scandals and the various other right. kind of, you know, greasy, sleazy scandals. Um, there was a, a fatigue with the Clintons. Um, the Clintons have a profound mistrust of the press. Um, you, you combine these two things right. together, you, you didn't have a great uh, formula for success there. Yeah, I mean, this question, I think, is more on the issue of how you do your job as, a, as an editor-in-chief, but... I think I've only been editor in chief for eleven months, so I don't actually a good job, know. Though, if I, may I don't say know so how to do the uh, job of editor in chief. <laughs> um, by the way, I go to a lot of meetings. That's what apparently it involves meetings. I understand that situation. Yeah, uh, the, Clinton, I think, is for, like on the Access Hollywood tape issue. Her point wasn't. I'm only not quoting the tape because this is being filmed, <laughs> apparently, and I don't want right, to. Right. Yeah. I think her point wasn't that it was covered. That, that, that the email scandals were covered more than Access Hollywood. I think her point is Access Hollywood was covered more than the evidence of Russian meddling. And the point there is, you know, the media is into sex and salacious stuff rather than into substance. And, and that's kind of the yeah, issue. Yeah, I mean, to be, to be fair, I mean, her frustration probably should not be with the media as much as it should be with the Obama administration. Barack Obama, for good reason, by the way, this is complex stuff, for good reason, didn't want to go out as far as he might, maybe could have right. to talk about Russian meddling at the time for the obvious reason that then it's seen that he is putting his thumb on the scale. Right. Um, but again, in the fullness of time, we, we, we understand that the Russian meddling was uh, of, a, of, a, of a nature that probably required the intervention of the sitting president. So I think, the, I mean, I think the press certainly would have followed the White House's lead in exploring yeah. that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I want to turn the conversation a little bit to some of the new players in the media landscape. I, I read the print edition of The Atlantic. I hope you'll keep, keep producing it, but yes. I know well, that you, my... If you keep paying, <laughs> we'll keep producing it. I know. Maybe <laughs> may, many of the students here, I think members of my own family, my kids, they are reading The Atlantic because they're, getting an, they're seeing an article on their Facebook yes. stream. And so I'm I want aware to, of this phenomenon, <laughs> right? For for better or worse, um, but I wanted to ask about some of these new players, and uh, particularly Facebook and and Fox News. Maybe we'll start with Fox News. Uh, what is that thing? I mean, like, what's the right category or or analog? I so it, I guess one view is it's the right leaning version of CNN, which is left leaning. Or, no, it's not that, it's, it's the American RT, pretty much, or something else. Like, wh what do you make? Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. And to be fair to Fox, um, it has serious reporters who run serious news-oriented shows. I mean, you could, again, there's a certain thumb on the scale you could see even in some of that coverage. But, but I want to be fair and say that they, you know, during much of the day, for instance, they're covering floods and hurricanes and, and iterative White House news in a, in, a, in a fine, responsible way. They have shows where you 
have, they have liberals and conservatives come on and argue. There are other shows when it becomes more, when it morphs into more of an entertainment network um, that uh, are partially responsible for creating that alternate cognitive ecosystem uh, in which, I mean, if you actually watch, um, even in recent days, especially in recent days, uh, the, the, the obsession with Hillary's emails, mm -hmm. the obsession with, uh, it, it's really fascinating. It's, it's litigate, they're, they're, the, some of the shows are relitigating re -litigating an, an election in which their guy won, which is kind of, that's the, again, you want to go to the theme of novelty. We don't, we don't have that experience. Um, in, in American politics. Um, so it's, it's a lot of different things that are going on, but certainly, um, and again, let me just, in the interest of, I think, fairness, but also truth, uh, he, you know, MSNBC, other publications on the left can create um, bubbles in which um, uh, certain viewpoints are just not going to be seen as legitimate and therefore not going to be expressed. In a certain way, I'm not. I'm not necessarily equating the two networks. Um, certainly not equating MSNBC's responsible portions with the irresponsible portions of Fox. But um, it is um, there's a bubbling resentment in America for years and years and years over globalization, trade, immigration, changing culture, racism, uh, and. Uh, Fox, uh, to some degree, is tapped into that and has become the voice for people who have decided that they are voiceless. Right. I think some of the concerns directed toward Fox, and maybe they're hyperbolic, maybe not, has to do, though, with that link, whether real or imagined, to power, to, to, to political power and, and to the state, even. And that's, I think, where the, the analogy could, could be totally wrong to RT. Right. In. Well, I mean, R RT, Russia, which used to be known as Russia Today before they rebranded themselves, um, um, is, a, is, a, is a state run uh, disinformation operation. I mean, it's not anything more or less than, than, right. than Although that. Although, if I could just, you know, yeah. it's, I think the world is so complicated. I would agree. And I don't want to oversimplify. Yeah, I, I know that there's a. It doesn't, it's not <laughs> clearly state run, but it sure feels state run, and it's confusing. I wouldn't go to it for information that I wanted to be true. What I, I, I wouldn't go there for, right. for I wouldn't go there for its uh, reasonable take on the day's events. Right. Um, it operates on behalf of a of a Kremlin worldview. I mean, I think you just have to yeah. watch it for a few minutes. And so I, the point is that Fox is not that, and it's not <laughs> no, I don't want to do direction. that. You know, look, I mean, this is the danger of kind of goes back to this interesting point about the pressure on journalism right now. One of the um, and I'm not saying that we succeed at this any better than anybody else does, but one of the things that we have to do right now is keep our composure. Mm -hmm. um, and part of keeping our composure is not to say that um, the, the Trump administration is the, is, is the uh, return of uh, Nazism. Part of keeping your composure is not to say that uh, Fox News is state-run disinformation television. Um, part, part, of the, part of the job of uh, keep, I mean, by, by the way, private citizens do whatever they want, obviously. I'm just saying, if you're a media outlet and you're trying to sort of grapple with the complexities of the reality around you, um, it's just not to give in to sort of an oversimplified narrative about, you know, Manichaean almost worldview that there are these absolute evils and there's absolute good, and we're just on one side of that divide. Yeah. I know that's unsatisfying, but... No, I think that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it maybe is a good segue then into the Facebook discussion because my sense is that perhaps more from the left today than the right, there's some, a growing critique of Facebook as a, as a vehicle for foreign influence, foreign governments who are intentionally trying either to directly meddle in elections or even just indirectly it's a vehicle. Stir, right, stir I mean, up it's trouble. All, all but, it but is they, is a vehicle. But, but the, the critique has gone farther, I think certainly in recent days, which is saying, Facebook is not cooperating. This corporate entity is not cooperating with whatever, an investigation, not, not cooperating with yeah. providing information. And therefore, if I've got the critique right, they need to be regulated. Something needs right. to be done. Right, right, right. They like to think of themselves as the telephone company. We just provide some wires and tubes and you talk to each other. Um, right. But it doesn't work like a telephone. That was the, that's the big difference. Right. Uh, I mean, when I, when I say it, it is, you're talking about as a vehicle for X, Y, and Z, I mean, it is just, for, in their own view, uh, it is just a vehicle. It's a vehicle for recipes. It's a vehicle for, you know, <clears throat> weather reports. It's a vehicle for Russian propaganda. It's a vehicle for 
you know, racist invective. It's a vehicle for fake news. It's a vehicle for pretty pictures of cats. I mean, it's, you know, it's just a vehicle. And that's where they, they in, in their, they, I, th I think to some degree, they, they are still in a bubble. This is why they're, I mean, you were making a reference to this. I think this is why, to some degree, they're behind the eight ball in terms of their, the damage that's being done right now to their reputation. Um, they, they don't seem to have um, kept up with the changing feelings about what they do, and therefore they're now under pressure. They could, be, they could face some serious uh, and opportunistic regulatory uh, efforts by part of both Republicans and Democrats. So, right. so they have not, I don't think they've managed their situation wonderfully well. I mean, the other critique, by the way, which I, I want to bring up, and I'm not necessarily bringing this up in the context of my own company, because um, we're still doing okay from a business perspective. Right. But you know, Google and Facebook together um, could destroy the digital advertising businesses of every quality media outlet in America, in the world. Uh, and the reason that we can produce what we like to think of as quality, and you think of in many cases as quality journalism, is because we make money from digital advertising. If, if right. the advertisers decide to cut out the middleman, which is the, 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 the quality platforms, and just go right to the, to the place where many people are seeing our product. Go back to your original point, which is that a lot of people, actually most people who see Atlantic stories, uh, plurality at least, are seeing them through their Facebook feeds. Um, if that disappears, um, then I don't know what the next model is, but we don't really have it yet. Um, and so this goes back to this broad theme of what is Facebook's responsibility mm -hmm. as the 800-pound gorilla of the communications, uh, global communications infrastructure. Uh, and and I, I haven't seen them sort of grapple with it. They make noises about, I mean, because they love our content. I mean, obviously, you know, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, we, we push out a lot of stuff onto Facebook, and it fills people's feeds with interesting things, and it keeps people on Facebook, and more importantly, it helps Facebook gather information about the users, and it lets them put advertising next to our content. So they, they have a benefit around it, but, you know, uh, they haven't actually sort of acknowledged their power. Right, and with the lack of acknowledgement, I wonder and worry to some extent that the state in a number of countries, maybe including the U.S., will become increasingly involved in either developing a sovereign internet or determining who, what are, who are going to be the channels, what's going to be the channels, and what well, really are they It doing. already happens in other countries, in right. Facebook and other, to be fair, other internet companies, other web-based companies do give in frequently, obviously, to the demands of authoritarian governments. Right, I mean, this is not, I, I'm a, I'm pretty near to free speech absolutist as you can get. It's not, I mean, it's, it's partially ideological, but it's partially practical. I don't want anyone telling me what I can't hear. I want to make right. the choice about what I want to read and what I don't want to read. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to cede to you the, the uh, uh, control over the flow of information, even information you and I both agree might be heinous information or heinous, uh, you know, attacks or whatever. Um, and, and so, and so, yeah. If we start going down this path of regulation, we got another problem on our hands. Mm -hmm. um, let me shift again a little bit, but also related You're to very a, shifty. I'm very shifty <laughs> by nature. Uh, this also question references an article in um, in the current issue of the Atlantic's. Uh, so this is a question about Ta-Nehisi Coates's article, the first white president. And if I again, I may have misconstrued the argument, but if I got it right, I it think was a it, fairly straightforward punch was, in the nose kind of yeah, argument. Yeah, it, it definitely a lot of punches in the yeah. nose. But if I got it right, the argument says uh, people like me. Uh, who are worried about, I don't know, the current moment, maybe, maybe there's kleptocracy, maybe there's a risk of autocracy, our liberal values are, are, are under threat maybe from the left, from the right. That, that's, not the, that's not the problem. The real problem is racism. And it's not a new problem. This particular president has just made overt what's been quietly lingering in the past. And people like me can worry about liberal values and free press and, and you know, avoiding kleptocracy because 
people like me are beneficiaries of a, of a set of injustices that have just been, haven't been changed, but have been brought out to the public by the current president. Yeah. First, did I get the argument right? And if yeah, that's I mean, right, yeah, what do we do? What's the response? Well, you know, the, you know, the, the interesting thing, I mean, so, so, I mean, I think a lot of people here are probably familiar with ta Coates' work. Uh, he, uh, I, I mean, I, I have to be not careful the way I speak about him because uh, I'm the editor and we're also very close friends. And so I, I'm more optimistic than he is. I mean, most people are more optimistic than he is, to be fair. Um, but, um, you, you know, I, I would say that he would not deny that he's an essentialist in this kind of, in this kind of way, which he says the original sin remains the surpassing sin. Everything that you described, every, if you're anti-Trump, every negative characteristic of this moment um, flows from a decision by the majority of white voters in America to vote for someone they understood to be a racist. I mean, his argument is, is, is I mean, I think it's a fascinating argument, and it's, and it's beautifully rendered. Um, his argument is, is essentially that we, we, we had a discussion, Tanasi and I had a discussion back and forth with other editors about, about the, the, the headline on it, the, the title of it, the first white president. It's not immediately obvious what that means, because obviously, you know, we've had 42 uh, white presidents, uh, because you count Cleveland twice. Uh, that's why. People <laughs> always working you, on No, that. no, 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 no. It's hard because you count the term, whatever. It's trivia. It's, it's a Jeopardy question. Um, but we've had, we've had 250 years of white presidents. What, what he's arguing, which I think is fascinating, is that, is, that, is that Donald Trump doesn't exist as a president without Barack Obama. Right. Uh, that, that, that people who chose him chose him consciously as a, as a, as a means of erasing uh, negating the black president, um, and 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 in this sense, he he is a person who, who the voters who voted for him voted for his whiteness, rather than a set of conservative policies maybe that associate people associate with white privilege or the white power structure. You get what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And, and 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 so and so it's a fascinating unfurling of of that argument. I mean, I tend to think. Um, and, and it's, this is not private information. Um, he and Ta-Nehisi and President Obama have been in a uh, long-distance argument for several years, uh, sometimes a short-distance argument, actually, about the moral arc of the universe and the direction in which it bends. Obviously, <coughs> excuse me, uh, obviously President Obama, uh, quoting Martin Luther King Jr., uh, uh, argues that the moral arc of the universe is long, and it, but it bends toward justice. He uses his own life, mm -hmm. his, own, his own story, as proof of that. Ta-Nehisi, um, who, whose father was a Black Panther, who comes out of another understanding of America, American history, uh, argues that to the extent that there is a moral arc of the universe at all, it bends toward chaos. Uh, and you know, and, and, and obviously there are a lot of people now who might have been on Obama's side a year ago, a year and a half ago, who now feel a little bit like, oh, Tanahasi's onto something. Um, but but that's the that's the general backdrop. And, and I think, I mean, the way I would, to the extent that I would argue with Tanahasi about this, um, my own view on this is that. To vote for Donald Trump doesn't necessarily make you a racist in the way that I understand what a, what a racist is. To vote to have voted for Donald Trump means that um, you made a conscious decision or didn't notice, that's the other part, but you made a conscious decision not to look at all of the things that he had said and done over the years. Like, you, you, you had, you had looked, at, looked at his character, looked at his statements, looked at his record, and said, I don't care about that, or I, I'm, I'm analyzing that out of existence in order to get over that hump. It, you know, I, I don't think I actually disagree with ta that much in that understanding. Rep, I read the article, though, as also having a really quite pointed critique of the media, and the, the press, in the yes. sense that it's saying... The, the sympathy in, for the white working well, class. Well, that, but also he's saying that the framing of the discourse as our freedoms are under, like, our liberal values, our freedom of the press, our free speech, 
that that's a smokescreen. It's a distraction. It plays into the, norm I think he's saying, the normalization of just racism and, right. and hierarchy because that's not the right. thing that's being called out by the media. Right. Part of his critique is a critique of liberal writers um, who, for instance, talk about the plight of the white working class. And what he points out is it's a bit of a misnomer to say that these are, these are just aggrieved, unemployed coal miners who voted out of economic desperation for Donald Trump. People who voted for Donald Trump, were in, included in Donald Trump's base, are people who make a lot of money and yeah. do very well for themselves. Um, and, and so that's, that's one piece of what you're talking about. I think um, the other piece is, is it goes back to his core analysis of America, which is that we haven't actually grappled with who we are. Right. Um, and that Trump is a slightly more obvious manifestation of our true nature. I mean, this is the, you know, there's this expression politicians use, and, and Tanasi and I have talked about this actually, it's interesting. Uh, after a Dylan Roof or after, um, you know, name your, name your atrocity, politicians, <clears throat> politicians will come out and, and say, well, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. We're better than that. We're not, you know, this is not who we are. And what Ta-Nehisi is saying, I think, I, I hope I'm not misconstruing or, or mischaracterizing his basic view is, says, no, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. This is what we are. And, and we haven't actually made the move yet to not be that thing that we are. He thought, I think, I mean, I think even he gave, and by the way, I paint him as a negative, he's actually one of the nicest, sweetest people in the world. People don't actually know that about him. Because uh, you look from afar and people think that he has this, you know, pretty harsh critique of American society, and he does, um, but it's not personal with him at all. Um, but, but essentially, you know, he, he's saying, look, until you actually grapple with who you are, we're not going to get through this. And he doesn't have a lot of faith that America will ever get through it. Right. Um, moving to the, <laughs> yeah. the right of center side yeah. of the spectrum again, and still sticking with the Atlantic, uh, David from had, yeah. and if I may say so, a great piece last March, right, right on, on um, kind of laying out the possible path toward autocracy in, right. in the United States. And right. again, if I've got the argument right from former speechwriter for George W. George Bush, w. Bush. Uh, suggested that if the the fascinating thing about this moment, by the way, is is you know Donald Trump. I mean, he's a uniter, not a divider, in the sense that he got Ta-Nehisi Coates and Jack Goldsmith and David Frum on the same cover of the same magazine, you know, making but, different sorts of art. I assume the editor-in-chief has something to do with that. Yeah, well, you know, but I mean, it, it's, 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 you wouldn't think, I mean, it, it's, it's my personal view that, and knowing them both, uh, one better than the other, but knowing them both, that George W. Bush and Barack Obama have a lot more in common with each other than, than George W. Bush has with Donald Trump. I mean, I think that's, that's how right. unusual this moment is, right. you know. But anyway, sorry. And, Don right, and that gets exactly the point of um, just how uncertain this moment is. And so I read from as basically saying, media is fine and it's in this game, a little bit like what you said earlier, Jeff, that look, there's this president and the media's, yeah. mainstream media is identifying his, um, lies or half-truths, and, and that's all kind of a game, but that, it doesn't really matter that much what that game looks like, and that if there's a move toward autocracy, it's not going to happen with people marching in the streets, notwithstanding Charlottesville. It's going to be kind of the slow increase in temperature, you know, the, or the salami slice. I don't know what the right metaphor is, and it's going to happen without the media really even identifying it. The media will keep screaming, yeah. and there'll be the uh, elites who will read it, but because it's going to happen so slowly and so imperceptibly, kind of like Philip Roth's uh, uh, you know, Lindbergh, uh, yeah, 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 Plot Against America, it's going to feel so normal that the only way to stop it, if you believe you know, this critique from the right, the only way to stop it, it's not the media who's going to do it. It's going to be Republicans. Right. It's going to be mainstream Republicans, and um, it's going to be individual citizens who are going to stand up and say, this isn't right. Or alternatively, it'll be citizens who'll say, this is right, that the, the mainstream just hasn't answered well, that, that's problem. The, that's the nervousness of this moment, which is that people seem to, a, a large enough people seem to normalize to this that it makes you wonder. Right. You know, questions that you didn't think were open questions in America are open questions. But, um, 
No, the interesting thing about, uh, well, one of the interesting things about his argument, I think his argument is a, is a sophisticated and nuanced one, right? It's not brown shirts in the streets. It's not Handmaid's Tale. It's not whatever. Um, <clears throat> certainly not Handmaid's Tale, right? Um, it's um, our, our pattern, right, in America is that um, you become president and then you get rich. Or you get rich and then become president and then stay rich afterwards, right? But, but, but the, the, the slow move toward that kind of corrupting autocracy is a president who becomes president in order to get richer. And, you know, obviously we've seen that, that pattern already with the family and, and, and you know, with the, you know, the constant branding opportunities. I mean, at the UN this morning, uh, Trump talked about what a wonderful building the UN is because it helped raise the value of the hotel he owns across the street. I, I, I mean, this is... Um, Different. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, um, it's, that, it's, that sort of, it's that sort of stuff. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the Boy Scout speech. If you recall the, the speech that he gave uh, a month ago or, or a month and a half ago, um, you know, where, where it's custom in a democracy for a president to go before the Boy Scouts and talk about democracy and pluralism and tolerance and good values and all the rest. And, and, and Donald Trump used that as a, as a, as a attack the press and, 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 and be divisive and, and, and all the rest. Uh, I mean, there are... There are a hundred subtle ways in which you degrade and decay uh, a society that puts it on the road toward what we, you and I might think of as more uh, of a more autocratic society, and and that's what David was referring to. I mean, when he first came to me with this idea, I said, "I don't want to do uh, Handmaid's Tale." Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we're we're there yet. I, I mean, I do think that American institutions are re resilient. I think they're, they're more resilient than maybe the American norms, but I think the, the institutions and the legal system and the courts are, are resilient, and I want to do that. And David said, no, that's not my, my argument is not that this ends with a bang. My argument is that, that, that it's, uh, you know, a, a, as you know, it is not true that if you put a frog in slowly boiling water, the frog lets himself be boiled. The frogs do try to jump out. People right. have studied that. Um, but never, you know, but, but so it's not, it's not that they were the slowly boiled frog, but it's, it's that we'll normalize to anything. And I think David is on track. I asked him um, a couple of weeks ago. But, and but I, again, with like a little pointed jab at the press for participating in that normalization. The show, you mean? Yeah, the show and, yeah, you know, calling out lies and... I don't really do. I mean, you know, I, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm captive to yeah. the idea that that the mainstream press. I mean, I happen to be pro mainstream press. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm mainstream. You are media. mainstream press. I, I I am no no no. And you know, and, and the reason I we we don't do anything perfectly. God knows, right? Um, but why has this happened? Why are we here? The one of the reasons we're here is because for the golden age, as I might think of it now of the American press, we served as filters um, and gatekeepers. And I mean, right. like, here, I used to cover, I mean, I used to cover extremism, right? And 25 years ago, if you believed that the IRS had planted a chip in your head and was communicating your thoughts to the CIA, uh, you stood outside the IRS building with a, with a funny hat and a four-page screed typewritten that you would hand to annoyed passerby, right? And I've now you have a show. Right, right. You know, now, now you're Alex Jones yeah. um, <laughs> on, on the internet talking about lizard people um, and, 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 you know, and, and flogging outrageous ideas. And millions of people are being infected by this. And, and so I'm not going to deny that that the advent of the web created, um, you know, a democratization that allowed marginalized people to have a bigger voice. But I'm saying that there is some utility in having filters uh, and, and to keep out untrue, obviously untrue things. And right. sorry, I didn't mean to go on that MSM rant, but no. but there was some value to it. Right. Probably probably we were too we. I mean, I was. I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, 80s. We were too arrogant about it, too exclusionary, but, right. you know, there was some value there. 
Well, let me ask one more question, one or two maybe, and then we'll open it up. So I have a, a question about a specific thing that happened, uh, not, not to the Atlantic, but to the New America Foundation. So this oh, is this thing yeah. in the last, you know, really over the course of the summer where probably you're familiar with it, the EU had a antitrust ruling against Google, you know, big $2.7 billion, and um, a scholar at the New America Foundation wrote a supportive piece for the EU judgment, the ruling, and the piece was up, and then it went down, and a few days later, the, um, the scholar and his 10-person team was fired, and then an email trail appeared suggesting that Google was the big um, source of funding for New America Foundation, and Google didn't like that kind of yeah. research. And you know, who, the, I don't vouch for any of the details of that, sort of the accuracy of my account, but the general no, your, your, your account is, is accurate. It's motivate, we don't, don't understand motivations. Right, and who did what to whom, but there's, a, I think the reason why that case caught my attention is whether we're in the media or academia, that there are a number of newly powerful, extremely wealthy companies that are playing now. They're also playing in the media business, and they're, in some cases, funding various kinds of research. On the left, on the right, there's just a lot of money floating around. Yeah, Google's and, too big and Facebook's too big. Yeah, and the question is... I mean, I'll, it's just that's, that's, the, that's the dominant, maybe one of the dominant themes of our era. Yeah, they're big. Well, and it's not totally fair on my part to call out specific companies. There are a number of big new yeah, players. Yeah, it's pretty and, fair to call okay. out two companies <laughs> in particular. It's, they're big. They are, I think... And by the way, this is, this is a generic observation about bigness. I mean, I'm hoping that we return to an age where... I'm hoping there's a new you know, Louis Brandeis somewhere to talk about the, the danger of bigness and the danger of monopolies because, you know, four companies, you know, uh, can control a lot of our lives. We like these companies because they we enjoy interacting yeah, with so them. So how big a threat is, you know, we've been talking about Trump, we've talked about <coughs> the left, the right, but what about these corporate entities which are playing in the media space in a big way? They're playing in the, um, they're in the generation supermarket of research. Space they're, now. they're in the supermarket space, yeah. exactly. They're in the big data space. Yeah. Um, and they're in the global space and, you know, they don't pr presumably love to be regulated in right. sovereign kind of ways. Right. And how concerned are you about that? I'm very concerned about it because I mean I think the Europeans are probably ahead of us in understanding. We like bigness more than the Europeans, obviously. We're bigger. Right. Um, you know, it's just it's uh, self-interest or however you want to define it. Um, look, I don't I don't really like any company that for which I'm the product because yeah. we're just the, we're just products. I mean, we interact. I, I mean, I you know I, I can't speak for everybody. We interact with Google hundreds of times a day. You know, and every time we do something through Google, Google knows something more about us, which you can then package and sell. Facebook's the same thing. Amazon's the same thing. Um, and the that, sensors are walking around within our pockets. That yeah, no, I mean, we, we, you know, that's the joke of the sick joke of these these fears of the NSA, right? We want to be surveilled. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, you know, we allow ourselves to be surveilled in ways that the government wouldn't even dream of surveilling you. Uh, I understand the fear of uh, government power. I mean, we all seen a lot of paranoid 70s movies about government power, and we should fear uh, excessive government power in, in this regard. But we, we willingly allow ourselves to be surveilled. Um, yeah, I worry about it. I wish that there were 10 search engine companies that, that had, um, uh, that had, you know, equal salience in, in society. I wish that there were multiple platforms that people talk to each other on, not just Facebook. Bigness is not, um, it, 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 it's not necessarily a good thing. You know, because, and you know, this, by the way, could be a conservative critique of government. Yeah, absolutely. It's the nature of institutions to grow. Nobody goes to work for Facebook and say, you know what, I think we're big enough. Right. We have enough members, let's cut it off. Um, you know, nobody, nobody at Google says, I wish we had fewer searches. Sure. Um, or whatever it is that they're, that they're trying to do. Um, so yeah, I think we're probably heading into a period um, where there's gonna be more anxiety about how big these companies get. And then they're either gonna have to get ahead of it, going back to this original point, they're gonna have right. to get ahead of it, or somebody's gonna get ahead of it for them in probably a, 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 a klutzy and maybe dangerous way. Right, and we're seeing a number of countries trying to get ahead with some, right. you know, everything from China to... <coughs> right, and if you worry about democracy being on the back foot here, then you should worry about, you should worry about that more. 
And you have to right. Make, you know, because, because I mean, this is one thing that I've learned, I think, in the last year is that uh, just because your country has been democratic for 240 years doesn't mean it's always going to be democratic. And just because your country is autocratic doesn't mean necessarily its effort to regulate something is nefarious. Perhaps. Well, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I don't like, I don't like, you know, I wouldn't want to be a Chinese citizen trying to interact with the internet, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where, which way the moral arc is bending anymore. Right. That's the, I mean, I think that if you had to sort of boil it down to its essence, this is the, this is the question, you know, we believe, and, 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 and I think we just had a president who believed that time marches forward, that people become, that, that America, the American story is the one of the, uh, sometimes things go sideways for a little bit, but the gradual expansion of rights, the gradual embrace of progressive ideals, the gradual embrace of democracy. We thought, obviously, 25 years ago, certainly up till almost today, at least till the Iraq war and probably even today, that democracy was just on the march and openness and freedom of speech were on the march. And, and, you know, and that's you know, end of history stuff. Right, and right. that's, I don't know, no, I don't think anybody can make any assumptions about anything anymore. Yeah, yeah. That was depressing. That, 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 that was a depressing that's, thing. That's conclusion. certainly a lesson we're yeah, all learning. That's, that's not happy. This is great, Jeff, but I want to bring everybody else into, or as many of you as possible into the conversation. Uh, we have microphones on either aisle. Both aisles have microphones. If you have a question, I especially encourage students to line up if you have a question. Please uh, line up behind the microphone, and we'll just call you in order. Go ahead. And if you're willing, please say who you are. Uh, I'm Jeff Colgan. I'm a professor at the Watson Institute. Thank you uh, for coming to speak to us today. You wrote a, a, a wonderful uh, and very sophisticated essay about Obama's uh, foreign policy toward the, the end of his presidency. And so I wonder Go on. Uh, if you could, if you could uh, agree with me that we are in a new era uh, yeah. now. Uh, and so uh, some days I wake up and think, uh, you know, OK, uh, Trump might not be my favorite president, but we'll get through this. And then there are other days, like today, where the President of the United States goes to the United Nations and says uh, that he would like to totally destroy North Korea. Uh, and I think, wow, maybe we have to worry a little bit more than we are on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would love your thoughts about which version of me is right. <laughs> the unhappy one. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's one, one possibly interesting observation I could make about that, which is I, I, I spent a lot of time talking to Obama about the crazy Nixon, crazy Nixon approach to uh, sure. international diplomacy. The crazy Nixon idea is, and this is something that Henry Kissinger used to good effect, he would say to the, he would say to the Soviets, for instance, you know, look, look, I understand where you're coming from, but the guy I work for is crazy. You don't know what he's going to do, right? Obama's problem might have been in negotiation that he was too rational, that everybody understood, and he, he sometimes articulated uh, first, the, all the things that he wouldn't do. Um, so you could look at the way Donald Trump talks and tweets about North Korea and say, oh, he's just employing the crazy Nixon approach to international diplomacy, um, and, and, and maybe that'll work. Maybe that'll scare the North Koreans into compliance. Maybe that'll scare China into cooperating. Um, the problem with that, and let me say this advisedly, because there's can't. The problem with that is that in order for the crazy Nixon approach to work, you can't be crazy. Like, you can't actually, no, and so, and so this is, and I'm not saying that Donald Trump is crazy, but I'm saying that, that we are in a situation, I, I believe this, we're in a situation where there's a non-negligible chance. I don't want to put, I don't want to put my, you know, I don't want to suggest that this is a probable thing or even, you know, even semi-probable, but there's, there's a non-negligible chance that we could find ourselves in a war caused by a misinterpreted tweet. That's new, and that's bad. That's my position on that. Okay. <laughs> bad. Right about that. Not good. Bad. Right about that. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Could you please speak to what's happened to language since we've had Trump? Uh, it, to lang language. To, la to language. To our language itself. When he speaks, it makes my skin crawl. He's a man who doesn't read. He watches TV, and it shows. When he. Today at the UN, when in almost the same breath he says, I come in peace, yet I'm going to wipe North Korea off the face of the map, 
And then we have to trot out McMaster and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who also makes my skin crawl, to, to explain, you know, to translate what he really means. I this think I, happens I think I over your, and over again. You don't like Trump. I got that. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're talking about the, 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 the decay of, of, of meaning or something in, that, in the words that well, we use? Well, you know, it's sort of happening... It's quite pervasive, but he's certainly helping m move it along. And well, I mean, when he says something and, and people really have to, can't understand what he, what does this mean now, you know? Right, I mean, I, look, on the one hand, he's an excellent communicator. I mean, I mean he's, he's very good at doing, at, at, at doing certain things. Um, can't, can't begrudge him that. Um, I actually think this is interesting in the in the in a, in a, in a uh, refracted through another prism, and that's the prism of of restraint. Uh, I, I mean, going to this going to this issue of norms. Uh, one of the one of the reasons this country has functioned for 240 years is that, or however long it is. Sorry, I can't do math. Um, one of the reasons that we function um, is because we all agree that restraint is a positive value. Restraint in in government reach, restraint in the way we talk to each other, the way, the restraint in the way we tell stories. Um, and, and, and this is where he is, again, um, unusual in that he's, he's, shifting the, he, he's shifting the boundaries and, and, and engaging in an unrestrained kind of discourse that other people follow. I mean, the, the really interesting thing to me, and I think Jack Goldsmith talked about this, um, is, is, you know, you know it's, it's um, the danger is that people live down to his expectations. Um, and you saw this in Marco Rubio during the campaign. Right. Remember, I mean, he was hurt by Donald Trump's insults, and so he started going back. And first of all, you don't, you don't try to you know, do the dozens with a guy who's so skilled at it like, like the Donald Trump. And so Marco Rubio lost the actual fight, but he also sort of degraded his own being. You know, he also sort of, he also, he also, um, humiliated himself by engaging in that kind of discourse. Uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about that lately, about, about, about restraint, and, and how restraint is something that we all just have to, we, we all collectively have to agree upon is, is, is a positive value, or else uh, a democratic society, open society, with so many different kind of groups can't work. Right, but if people, some people feel that a given society is very unfair, the extravagant statement, even if it's factually wrong, to, I think to people, many people, has an inner truth, whereas sure. the, you know, Glenn Kessler, whatever, the, the, yeah. the fact checker saying wrong, 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 you know, that's off the yeah, point. Yeah, because we're emotional creatures. I mean, and, and we're, not, we're not entirely logical, rational creatures. I mean, I always said about President Obama, it was that, you know, he was disappointed in, in people because they weren't as smart, logical, as rational as he was. I mean, he famously said that if, you know, if the entire world was just Scandinavia and Singapore, everything would go swimmingly well because it's just, you know, cool-minded technocrats doing the thing that's the obviously true, rational thing to do, but it's not the way we're constructed. And so what you need, I go back to the Boy Scout, and now what you need is the person at the top to model certain kind of behaviors, and that's what we've we generally speaking, always had. Even when you have a Bill Clinton-type situation, at least there was a recognition of hypocrisy in it. You know, Don Donald, Donald Trump, when he tells a tall tale, when he lies about something, he, he, he lies about it without shame, and when he's caught, he doubles down. Mm. And that's, that's unusual. That's, different? And, yeah, that's different. <laughs> that's different. Hi, my name's Jack. I'm a sophomore at Brown. Um, and so in my understanding, uh, the Atlantic has always prided itself on being nonpartisan, on being beholden to no party or clique. Yes. Um, and I find it really interesting that the Atlantic has chosen three presidential candidates to endorse, uh, Lincoln in 1864, Johnson in 1964, Hillary Clinton last year. Right. And so I'm wondering, uh, kind of, uh, given that the Clinton endorsement was framed as being part of this nonpartisan history uh, and kind of putting the thumb on the scale of history in a kind of way, at least in my understanding, I'm wondering what it means for the Atlantic as an organization um, that we are now in a world where the Atlantic has endorsed two pretty like widely backed candidates who won, and then one candidate who lost. Right. Yeah. So you noticed that our Hillary Clinton endorsement didn't work. Uh, <laughs> the uh, no, it's interesting. Um, no, the funny thing is, um, by the way, you get an internship. Um, the uh, the 
and you get an internship, and you get an internship. Right? <laughs> I'll yeah. take one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the, um, the interesting thing was, in 1860, the, uh, the Atlantic endorsed Lincoln, but in 1864, they didn't endorse Lincoln, didn't endorse anyone. And I, you know, it, this is lost to the, you know, this is lost to history, the, the reason. But I, I, it's like, what, what? He wasn't winning the war fast <laughs> enough? Like, what, what are you complaining about? It's still Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> it's like, I don't know, he just disappointed me. Hope and change, and then what happened? Uh, but, but, but what you, put, put Lincoln aside, because the Atlantic was founded by abolitionists, and that was obviously, um, uh, you, you know, the, the Atlantic was born in a way to support a presidency uh, like that of Lincoln. The big complaint of the founders of the Atlantic, this is true, was that Lincoln wasn't going fast enough or hard enough. Um, and there were fights at the Atlantic at that time. Um, the, the, the Hillary Clinton endorsement, which is actually more of an anti-endorsement than a pro-Hillary endorsement, um, uh, was exactly in line with the 1964 anti-endorsement of Barry Goldwater, which was a decision that we made that, that this person is out of um, a characterological or experiential mainstream, m meaning that, 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 that they're not qualified to serve in office. It was not, it was very, very specifically, and, and um, I, I guess it's not a secret, I wrote that endorsement. Um, you, you know, I, I was thinking very hard about that. I mean, everybody participated in it, I should say. But, um, but I, I, did, I did an early draft of it. And, and my thought all along was, I don't, it's, not, it's not about ideology. I don't care about, uh, I, we're not going to endorse or not endorse someone based on their approach to health care or the earned income tax credit or how to manage Iran. You know, we're, we're, we were only looking at um, issues of uh, what Bob Corker would call stability to serve. Um, uh, experience, character, truthfulness, uh, general issues of disposition. Um, what does it mean? Uh, it means that we don't have enough subscribers in Wisconsin. Uh, that you know Donald Trump won. Um, you know one of the things, <coughs> one of the things I actually resent in, in a way is when people talk about the bubble, the the the, the people of the mainstream media or universities or. The coastal elites, whatever, and you know we, we've got our certainly got our problems, obviously. Um, but I, I sometimes I remind people that this bubble is actually bigger than the bubble that supported Donald Trump, and and it, because of a peculiarity of the electoral college and particular weaknesses of a particular candidate, um, this is why we're in this. I don't, I don't read too much into this other than uh, uh, to say that that an unbelievable number of Coincidences, a number of of of, of, of very rare uh, occurrences had to conspire together to bring about the presidency of Donald Trump. We don't have to spend time on this, but I would just say though that there's a feel, whether it's Brexit or the strongman Modi uh, yeah. um, um, rule in India, or you know, in a very different, to totally different system, Xi Jinping in China. There is a feel that there's a historical global moment of yeah. And the global elites are not responding to it adequately. Right. I don't think anybody's going to disagree right. with that. But I don't know if, if there is a response that's... I mean, look, people put aside these... I mean, I, I, I say this advisedly. Put aside issues of <clears throat> xenophobia, anti-Obama feeling, misogyny, racism. And just look globally, you know, <clears throat> or let's, let's, look at, let's look at three phenomena that, that, that scare... Um, Americans, uh, uh, a lot of Americans, uh, free trade, globalization, uh, in, in, in the non-trade aspects of globalization, uh, and the disruption of work, the rise of, ro of robots. Um, government can't, uh, you, know, you know, government, there's no response to, to technological disruption that government can have. You can't be a Luddite in government. Um, globalization is inevitable. That's just what happens. Um, Trade is something that, I mean, this is why wall, you know, like the, the, we should have understood that Donald Trump had a good chance of winning the moment he introduced the concept of a physical wall, right? Uh, because walls keep out bad things. That's why, you know, walls keep out NAFTA. Um, we're, 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 in a, we're in a moment of enormous change. A friend of mine always says that, you know, we're, we're leaving the, the epoch of human history in which male upper body strength can earn someone a living enough to buy food for his children, right? That's been true. For all of history, and we're in the last 20 years, we're, we've been leaving that period. It's frightening period. Um, global elites have not been up to the task of 
of grappling with what it means for people who aren't part of the global elite. Um, and government hasn't leveled with people. Like, you know what? I mean, this is, this is the, at the end of the day, what's going to happen to these coal miners who think they're getting their jobs back from Donald Trump? They're not getting their jobs back. I hope that they realize that at a certain point. Um, but nobody, nobody will level with anybody about, about the, the massive disruption that we're undergoing. Right. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go on the disruption spiel. No, um, do another great. Question. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a junior here at Brown. Thank you so much for being here, and thank, thank you. you, Professor Steinfeld and Watson, for making this happen. Um, so I think it's fair to say that uh, Trump is the TV president and that he monopolized or abused the medium to monopolize attention and say things that appeal to a particular group of people in an extreme way. It's not abuse if you want to be abused, though. Sorry? Sorry, I was being I, Yoda-like for a okay. second. <laughs> Um, well, he was, he expertly was able to say things that right. um, captured attention, right? Right. Um, my question is how, basically how concerned are you that Facebook and social media in general and analytics, um, how will those things, um, is it possible that those things will be abused by a future demagogue to um, gain the same sort of attention and exposure um, that Trump was able to get by using TV? Yes, I mean, and there are a lot of people in the Valley who, who uh, Remember, there's a whole there's a whole sub industry in uh, in tech that looks at ways to manipulate you to become more dependent on a device or a product or a platform. Uh, you know, the the there there you know there there are there's a huge infrastructure there to produce dopamine squirts in your brain. Um, you know, uh, on Instagram. You know, a after you interact with Instagram, after you interact with Twitter, um, and so obviously. Politics, politicians, consultants will take advantage of that sort of thing. I mean, it leads to a separate related question, which we don't have time for, I don't think. Um, but you, you, you know, the 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 largest question, the largest question is the things that were let out of the bag in this last cycle. Can you put them back in the bag? I mean, and we won't know this question. We won't know the answer to this question for three years or seven years. I mean, and the, the, big, the biggest question to me is, is the next pre, does the next president conform to the, the model, the basic model we have of what a president is? And does the, that next president return to the norms and values that we associate in a bipartisan way with the presidency? Um, the temptations are huge, obviously, to go down a pathway that Donald Trump went down. Uh, Maybe, you know, the, what, what is the danger? The danger is, is someone who is more effective, let's say, than Donald Trump at actual governance, uh, but using some of the techniques. Uh, and by the way, I don't know what the Trump presidency is going to look like next year. It could, he could be a liberal Democrat next year. We have no idea. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I mean, no, nobody knows anything. That's part of the instability of the moment. Um, but that, that, to me, is the big question. But, you know, once you, once you open Pandora's box, you know the rest. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Hans. I am currently a freshman at Brown. And um, my question is, so there has been an increasing obsession in the American public with the concept of fake news that uh, objective fact can at times be considered subjective. So I was just wondering, uh, what has the effort been like to uh, sort of rebrand uh, facts like and legitimate journalism again, as legitimate? Yeah, you know, uh, I get that. I get uh, it's, a, a, it's a very smart question. It's, it's a question that's asked a lot of people in the media, which is to say, what are you going to do to convince people who no longer buy your understanding of the way the world is organized? How are you going to get them to come back to the enlightenment understanding of empirical, ascertainable reality? I, I guess that's what you're, you're getting at. Um, and, and you know there there is no good answer. I can't convince somebody who doesn't want to believe something to believe in it, even if I show them. Sometimes, especially if you show them statistics, show them analysis, show them data uh, on it. Um, it's a frustrating moment. There's no choice but to keep doing what we what we do. Um, and and by the way, there's no mercy now uh, in in the, in the public climate. So journalistic mistakes made out of just because they're mistakes. People make mistakes. Um, are not forgiven in a way that they used to be. So we have to be more careful, um, more careful than ever. Uh, I, I, um, I tend to be an, more of an optimist on this question than some people in the following quick sense. Um, 
you know, your ability to succeed in life is going to be based on your ability uh, to take in observable reality, analyze it, and process it in a way that helps you uh, that helps you advance your career, your goals, your, your whatever you whatever you want to want to call it. Um, you know, people who succumb to conspiracy theories are generally speaking not successful people. They're looking for ex they're looking for external reasons for their to explain their own failure. Um, at the end of the day, if you go to work in finance um, and you and you don't accept math, you're not going to succeed. If you go to work in tech and don't accept that 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 there are processes to coding, you're not going to succeed. And so I, I tend to think. And, and I use the, I go back to the coal miners in, in a kind of way. Like eventually, people are going to see that Donald Trump did not give them a job in a coal mine, and maybe that observable reality will. Help. I'm going a little bit far afield from the fake news issue, but maybe that people will understand that that observable reality, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take it in and, and analyze it the way you and I might analyze it, which is that you've been made a false promise. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't actually think that we're leaving the enlightenment. I mean, if we are leaving the enlightenment, we're, we're, you know, we're screwed. But um, but I, I don't think we're I, I don't think uh, the Enlightenment values which um, we live by are are are, are so easily uh, eliminated. I think there historically there have been countries, Western countries that have departed for periods of time from the Enlightenment, and people collectively believed all kinds of things, and then not so long after look back at that and say, how did we possibly? Yeah, I can think of one in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. some obvious ones. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. This side of the room. Hi, my name is David. Uh, earlier when discussing the Coates piece, you said that voting for Trump doesn't necessarily make someone a racist. They may have overlooked that information. I was wondering what exactly you would define racism as, because Trump came on the scene talking about Mexico sending its rapists. He never really hid his racism for us. And yeah, in that no, way, no, no. I knew I was going to get in trouble at Brown when I said that, because uh, I didn't know, I didn't articulate it. I didn't. I mean, my personal view is that I'm just talking my personal. My personal view is that um, if you vote for somebody who talked about Mexicans the way that he talked about Mexicans, that makes you complicit in racism. I guess I'm saying that there's a a continuum of racism, and there's the 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 guys in Charlottesville, and then there's um, the person. Please forgive me for using the word. There's a person who's just not woke to um, to to certain realities in American life, um, and I don't want to just see what, what I don't want to do because I think of people as complicated. I don't want to lump everybody who voted for Trump into one 45. How many people voted for him? Uh, enormous basket. I do think that there are people, and maybe I disagree with Tana Hasi on this. I do think there are people who didn't think about it at all because they're in so much pain in their own lives. And they've seen their jobs disappear, their lives, their families disintegrate. And so they voted as a cry of despair. I, I, I don't want to lump a person like that in with Richard Spencer or, or any, for that matter, any Republican leader who consciously overlooked. Uh, and by the way, racism is only a piece of it. I mean, it's 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 misogyny, and it's 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 you know it's the indecency of attacking a POW, the indecency of attacking the family of a of a soldier who died a, a, a in combat because he was a Muslim. You know, I mean, it's it's there's so many things to talk about here in the in the record. I, I just want to be very very careful, um, maybe too careful, not to be unvariegated in my in my descriptors of all of the people who voted for Donald Trump. But yes, if you voted for Donald Trump, I think I, I feel, this is again my just personal opinion, it means you had to overlook, consciously overlook, a whole basket of badness, quite obviously. I was about to say deplorables, and I guess I just Yeah, yeah, them. yeah. No, no, I mean, that's the, yeah, I would flip deplorable. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming, Mr. Goldberg. My name's Ethan, I'm a junior here. Um, I have a question kind of about political journalism as it exists right now in the Trump era. Oh um, you mentioned kind of before your colleagues, Jack Goldsmith and David Frum, as these kind of campless Republicans, homeless Republicans. Yeah. Um, but it really goes far beyond those individuals, people like Charles Krauthammer, George Will, Jonah Goldberg, like champions of intellectual conservatism that um, are at tremendous odds with the presidency. 
Uh, do you think President Trump and the administration have any interest in kind of bringing these champions of intellectual conserv conservatism under his camp, or it's just beyond that point? No, I would say, based on reporting, I'd say that President Obama did much more outreach to those to, to the leaders of intellectual conservatism than, than Donald Trump does. Uh, no, Donald Trump has set himself up in opposition to that to that camp. Um, you know, there. I mean, and by the way, in ordinary times, people like Paul Ryan would just be in that camp. They are intellectual conservatives. Paul Ryan made his own uh, bargain here with uh, the current Republican president. I imagine that he'll rue the day, but he doesn't seem to rue it yet. I mean, that's just, that's just my political analysis of it. Um, it, is a, it is a big camp. I don't see Trump trying to bring those people in, because I don't think Trump is actually, in some ways, a conservative. He's a populist. Um, this is why, I mean, it's not only that Chuck Schumer is a New Yorker and Mitch McConnell is from Kentucky that Donald Trump gets along better with Chuck Schumer. I mean, Donald Trump, a populist, and this is, I mean, this is the, smart, the smart move on the part of the Democrats is to ma manipulate Trump's populism in a way that gets more health care for poor people or more spending on opioid treatment. Um, but. I don't think of Donald Trump as a conservative uh, in the way that, until last year, um, we, we understood conservatism. Thanks. Yes? Hi, I'm Alina, and I'm a freshman. And I was wondering about a piece from The Atlantic in June, My Family Slave, that received a lot of positive attention, reception. And I was wondering how you think The Atlantic can still promote these kinds of narratives while staying culturally relevant, especially when so much of culture now is about politics and about the Trump administration specifically. Wait, so I'm not, I, I'm not sure I understand. How do you stay relevant by? Like when, how can The Atlantic still promote these like different narratives and tell these stories while staying culturally relevant when so much of the cultural discussion that we're having now is about politics. Yeah, well, you know, it's, an, it's a very interesting point. Um, that story is, this is the, it's a story by a, a writer who, who uh, 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 tragically died before the story came out, um, Alex Tizon, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning Filipino-American writer um, who wrote this dark story about his, his what he calls his family slave, an indentured servant who came with them to America. Um, the amazing thing about this story, which we had on the cover in uh, May, I guess, um, is that it's now the second most read story in our entire history. Wow. I mean, if you want to, that's why I didn't understand your question exactly, yeah. because I think, uh, and, and, and first of all, it's a compelling narrative. It's a dramatic story. It's a dark story. People love stories. Um, uh, I think people are also sick of politics. And I think there was, it was sort of almost, we didn't think of it this way. Uh, you know, we're not that smart, but it turned out to be sort of counter programming. It's like people are tired of reading about Donald Trump after a while, and they want to read a really complicated moral tale with this, you know, tragic, you know, this, this tragic quality. Um, and so, you, you know, it's it's interesting. If there was a, obviously, you know, because we try to figure these things out beforehand, and you just guess. Um, there was no particular thought that this was going to be a big story for us, because it's not about famous people. It's not about an American. It's not about uh, American politics. It's not about you know, um, your smartphone is killing you, or you know, you know the the one vegetable you should eat, to whatever. You know, um, it, it was crazy. Uh, I mean, it just showed that what what it showed to me, and I hope I hope this is true for um, uh, for students. Uh, obviously, I hope this is that nine thousand word narrative journalism, pieces of narrative journalism, have salience in our in our culture today, in, in an Instagram culture. Um, I think it proved that point, and, and I can't wait to do more of that stuff. Maybe to the questioner's point, but I, I thought that was a great piece, too, and rather than just another thing about positional warfare yeah. politically, it, at least for me, said, look, here's a different way to see the world immediately around you. There are yeah. things going on there that you saw, but you didn't interpret it, so here's a different... I don't know, lens yeah. to, to see. I it. actually think this is part of, I mean, you're a freshman, so you won't even understand what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> but I think this is a part of getting old, um, older, um, is, is it, everything is complicated. People are really complicated. And this was a really, this is a story about a really complicated set of lives that had collided tragically. And um, 
I wasn't insulting freshmen, by the way. I'm just saying you're young, and you know the world is new and fresh. Um, uh, and and I, I just found this story fascinating because um, it doesn't doesn't end with any easy answers. Like I, we got criticized. I mean, we get, there's a lot of criticism of of, of the writer uh, in particular who wasn't there to defend himself, unfortunately. Um, but um, I mean, literally, people on, on uh, well, the, the stupidest tweets of all were the tweets that say, um, you know, he, he's a coward because he waited to publish this until he died. That was literally a tweet. Um, uh, and it's like, no, that's not how it actually happens. Um, but a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the traffic on this was, um, was uh, how could you, uh, how could people think of this guy, Alex Tizon, um, as a hero or anything other than an abominable person because his family had a slave. And what they don't understand is they know about this because he wrote a confession. Like, he was expiating the guilt and talking about the complexity of it. And, and by the way, it's, it's, it's interesting, not to open up a can of worms, but it's interesting in, 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 you know, in campus discourse where things become instantly polarized to actually look at a person like this and say, wait a minute, that's a really complicated life with all these contradictions, uh, goodness and badness in one place, uh, and a person trying to explain himself uh, and, and hoping that people are open to his complexity. Great, thank you. Yes. Hello, I'm Donnie. I'm a junior here at Brown. Um, I was, I'm seeing all of these resemblances between the Trump administration and the Nixon administration. And I was wondering if you can kind of, if you feel this in the same way kind of in journalism. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a golden age for investigative journalism for the same. I mean, golden ages of investigative journalism come about when, when you have uh, presidential administrations that have a lot of uh, corruption. I mean, this is interesting in, in a way. And I, I think about this a lot. We, our offices are in the Watergate, so I think about this a lot. I go through the door to get from the garage to my office that, that was the break-in door. So like, every day you're sort of like, you're in the Watergate. Here's Watergate. Um, the, uh, but this is not, I mean, you know, I'll tell you this funny thing. Uh, there's some fundamental difference between, I read a lot about the Nixon era, and um, it, it, there was a level of sophistication to the scandals in a way that's lacking in, in these scandals. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the self-inflicted quality of, of some of these more obvious scandals is, is interesting. To me, uh, I mean, people. Uh, I used to cover the mafia, and I asked, um, I asked a guy who's in the uh, not long ago uh, witness protection program. He was a Gambino family hitman who went to the witness protection program 25 years ago. I I, I used to uh, talk to him a lot, um, and I remember one thing he always told me. He 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 said um, he said you know if there's something that you want to steal and it's 15 feet away um, and it looks like it's going to be easy to steal, it's a trap. Um, like, it's, everything is more complicated. Like, don't go right for it because it's obviously a trap because nothing is, is easy. And so, you know, when I read the, um, the, the emails Donald Trump Jr. was sending about, oh, there's a Russian coming with information about Hillary. I can't wait to get it or whatever. I'm paraphrasing the email, obviously. Um, you know, it's like, it's like no one in the Gambino crime family would you know, go right for that information because it was too much of a, it was too obvious in a way. I think, I, I tend to think, you know, and I'm not, I'm talking about now a lot of the people who have already departed the Trump administration. Obviously there's some, there's some excellent people in there, people I've known from other walks of life. Um, I'm talking mainly about them, uh, the people who, who, who left, but there's something that, I, I think like some of the, the Nixon conspirators would look at these guys as sort of minor leaguers in a kind of way, in sort of the Scandal Olympics, you know, mixing in. Anyway, just a thought. Okay, let's take the last two questions together very quickly and we'll give Jeff the last word. Yes. I don't need the last Hi. word. Uh, my name is Lee, I'm a returning vet undergrad student. Uh, and my Are you question... wearing a Donald Trump shirt? I am. Oh, okay. Uh, he's trying to spell his name, spelling. Oh, oh, um, okay. Anyways, uh, so for um, talking about the slide to normalcy for the media that we've seen, uh, in just the past few days, Sean Spicer goes on late night TV and he's being made out to be a celebrity, yeah. uh, which for all intents and purposes is horrifying when you consider what his role in this administration has been. Yeah. So what do you think our best method of communicating to the media that they need to stop trying to uh, popularize these people? What, what is our yeah. best option for communicating that? Okay. Great, and then last question. Hi, um, I'm Zoe Wormelstein, I'm a freshman. 
Um, so the job of the press is supposed to be to you know, promote the exchange of ideas and bring truths to light, but at the end of the day, the press is a business with very specific clientels. So what I was wondering is to what extent are media outlets and publications on the right or left attempting to or succeeding in reaching audiences that don't necessarily agree with them? Right. Um, both good questions, thank you. Uh, and they're both, they're, they're related in a kind of way. I mean, and here I'm gonna put it right back on, on your question, I'm gonna put it right back on you. Uh, you, you, you know, we're, we're just, we just often, certainly entertainment, it's just a reflection of what you humans want. I mean, if, 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 if there was an uprising against Sean Spicer being on the Emmys, or if nobody, well, more to the point, if nobody watched and, and nobody uh, took in this entertainment, um, then there would be no reason for it. Um, so, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, you see this critique of the press, which I think is, um, is, is misdirected, or it's actually, it's actually psychological displacement. It's like, why are you giving me this thing that I want? You know, it's like blaming, it's like blaming Ben and Jerry because you like ice cream or something like that, you know, because you eat too much ice cream. Um, you, you know, so it's just, it's just, it, it, it's, it's us. It's all of us, and it's human nature. That's the problem. There's a question before about analytics. You know, if we had analytics in journalism 30 years ago, most of the newspapers would have probably closed their, their bureaus in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Because most Americans aren't really interested in news from sub-Saharan Africa. It was important to do. Nevertheless, and thank God it was done. But but that's that's the that's the nature of, of, of humans, uh, and it goes to your point about business. I mean, these this is um, these are businesses, um, and you know, yes, obviously, I have a critique about the way that uh, CNN in the you know treated those early Trump rallies as entertainment. A, they were entertaining, and B. CNN's viewers wanted it because CNN would have uh, the instant CNN the instant CNN understood that its viewers didn't want that they would have stopped doing it. Um, so it's a little bit more on the public and a little bit less on the media than I think some people would have it. Um, to the final point about the uh, reaching people uh, across divides, I mean I. You know I, I mean Jim Mattis, the Defense Secretary, has this. He's, he's a, a, a very good guy I've known for a long time. And, and he was asked recently, um, you know, what worries you most about the world or about America's role in the world? And he, um, you know, you would expect a certain set of answers, North Korea, Iran, whatever, this, that, the other. He says, he says, what I'm really worried about is that Americans have stopped liking each other. We no longer like each other. And when you don't like each other, you no longer try to understand each other. Um, I can't make people who don't, like me or don't like what I write like me. Um, but coming back to this theory of restraint, it's maybe we don't have to talk about people we hate with hateful language. Maybe we don't have to talk about our political enemies in grossly moralistic terms uh, in which we ascribe all negative qualities to them and tr without trying to understand who they are. And maybe we come back to a place uh, where there's a little bit more attempt for people to try to talk to each other uh, and, and try to understand their complexity. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. All I know is, I mean, I have a little slice of, of, uh, of the media landscape, and I know that we are trying to, um, you know, at the Atlantic, be a, still a big tent uh, and, and try to bring in conservatives who will argue with conservatives about the nature of conservatism, liberals who will argue with liberals about the nature of liberalism and liberals and conservatives are arguing together and try to remind them at the same time that we're all tied up together in a common destiny. Uh, you know, a, a, a polarized, fractured America uh, just isn't going to work for any of us. I mean, it's self-interest at a certain point to maintain your own dignity and maintain your composure and, and continue trying to communicate to people who don't like you that uh, your positions in a way that's respectful. And maybe that breaks down. Um, their own anger and hatred. I don't know. It sounds like I'm running for something. I should stop right now. I'm not running for anything. Um, but I, 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 really, I really think that, that very strongly, and I think Jim Mattis, in a kind of way, is, is right. Social media has divided us. The opportunity to be divided was always there. Social media has given us the tools to divide. Cable news has given us the tools to divide. 
reality TV set the stage for the rise of a kind of president we haven't seen who ex excels at division. Um, and, and, and we have to figure out a way out of that. You know, at the beginning, I very rudely did not go over Jeff's biography. I didn't talk about the so you Washington now, Post, Jerusalem knows, Post, yeah. New Yorker. Um, but I would urge you all to, to look at the pieces that Jeff has written over time to get a sense not just of the biography, but the insights. And I'd urge you to take a look at his, your 2006 right, memoir, really, of an unbelievably extraordinary um, friendship. And, I urge you to do that, and also take note that if I've got this right, your first journalism job was as editor of chief, editor in chief of the Daily Pennsylvania. I was editor in chief of the Daily the Pennsylvania at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a college journalist. That's a four-year school in Philadelphia. I don't know if anybody <laughs> uh, a competitor heard, heard of it, um, but yeah, no. I mean, I'm glad. I just got interviewed by the Brown. Dog. Got very good reporter from the Brown Daily Herald actually read something that I had written beforehand, which most reporters good. don't do. So, go college go, journalist. Go yeah. And and lastly, most important, I want to thank you, Jeff, for no, a really an extraordinary conversation. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.